James chapter 3. Tonight I'm going to talk about, and I'm entitled in this message, how to turn a negative situation around. How to turn a negative situation around. James chapter 3 is where we're going to get started. Now, let's just read, begin reading in verse 2. It says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Everybody say, turn about. Did you notice that that phrase is used in verses 3 and in verse 4? It says, turn about. Now, let's just pick up, start here tonight in verse 2. Because he tells us that if a man uh, doesn't offend in word the same as a perfect man, the Amplified Bible says that if he does not offend in speech, if he never says the wrong things, so that tells me that it's possible for a person never to say the wrong thing. You say, boy, that must be some super spiritual cat if he is able to never say the wrong thing. Well, listen to what it says. The Amplified says he never says the wrong things. He's a fully developed character, a perfect man, able to control his whole body and to curb his entire nature. Now, the Amplified says, just, just says, I mean, the King James says he's able to bridle the whole body. Now, everybody knows what a bridle is, something you put on a horse, right? Now, this word bridle in the original Greek is a compound word. It's two words that are put together to form the original Greek word translated by bridle. One of the words literally means to curb, C-U-R-B, or to headstall. Now, if you've ever rode a horse and you pulled hard on the reins, you've watched as he head stalled. He would either throw his head up or he'd throw his head down. Either way, it stalls him. Now, if you're riding a real uh, spirited horse, uh, they may, you know, rebel a little bit, but nevertheless, it stalls them from just taking off and running and doing whatever they want to do. And that's the picture that the writer wanted to give of stalling your, your body from doing what it wants to do from keeping to uh, keep going the way that it's going. The other word, part of that compound word, means to lead. So you put those two together, the original Greek word, it means to lead, to guide, to restrain, to hold in check. And that's exactly what you do with a bridle, isn't it? When you put it on a horse, you're holding that horse in check. You're restraining him. Now, that's the reason Amplified says that you're able to control this man. He's able to control his whole body and to curb his entire nature. And then James gives two examples that we want to look at in comparing the tongue. He uses two examples that he compares to the tongue and how powerful the tongue is and what it can do in our lives. Now, the first one we find in verse 3. He said, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Think about that. The bit is a means of making the horse obey. Is that correct? How many of you ever rode horses? Let me see. You ever rode a horse? So when you put that bridle on, it's got a bit in its mouth. The purpose of that bit is to make that horse to obey you, right? Now, he's, he's, he's talking about the tongue here, folks. He's using this first example of a horse, and he wants us to understand how you can turn situations around in your life. See, when you, just like here, he talks about that horse, you put the bit in his mouth to make him obey you, and we turn about the whole body. Because that bit, you know, when you pull on that rein, I mean, that head will turn. If you pull to the left, that head will turn to the left. If you pull to the right, that head will turn to the right. You understand what I'm saying now? Now, I want you all to get this picture. This word obey means to persuade. You've got to persuade that horse to turn the way you want him to turn. Has anybody ever rode just one of those crazy horses? Raise your hand if you ever rode a, rode a crazy horse. 
Oh, three or four of y'all have. I'm not the only one. We begged and begged for a horse when I was a boy. We went about probably seven, eight years old. My brother's only, my oldest brother's only a year older than me. We just kept begging for a horse, kept begging for a horse. And my daddy wouldn't get one, so my granddaddy decided that I, he'd get us one. He got us a Shetland pony. And that pony was crazy. That was the craziest horse I have ever seen in my life. Because that horse, I guess because we were so little, maybe somebody bigger got on him, might have could have done something with him. And uh, But that horse, he'd do everything he could, run up against a tree to rub you off, run up under limbs to knock you off. I mean, he'd do everything he can. I, that horse, I, I believe that horse was trying to kill us. And me and my brother, we just decided we're going to kill him before he kills us. And my daddy said he'd call it a draw, and he got rid of that crazy horse. Amen? But the whole purpose of that bitten bridle anyway is to make that horse to obey you and to persuade him to do what you want him to do, go the direction that you want him to go, okay? Now look at that phrase, turn about. We turn about their whole body. Now the word turn about in the original Greek means to transfer, to lead over, to direct to a point of destination, to a particular point of destination. Several years ago, back in uh, 1996, I'll never forget it. The Lord spoke to me. It was so loud. Matter of fact, I was standing right down here on a Sunday morning preaching. And it was so loud, I thought everybody would have heard it. But it was inside. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And that authoritative voice that the Holy Spirit uses at particular times. He wanted to get this message across to me. And believe me, uh, it was not one of those things where you think, was that the Lord's talking or, you know, no, I knew definitely. Man, it just shook me. It was so loud on the inside of me. And you might want to write this down because the Lord gave it to me. He gave it to me to give to you and to give to anybody that will hear and believe, okay, and act upon it. He said, determine the way you want your life to go and point your tongue in that direction. Determine the way that you want your life to go and point your tongue in that direction. In other words, for example, if you wanted to go north, he said, point your tongue to the north. If you want to go south, point it to the south. But what he was talking about was the way that you, I want my life to go, the way you want your life to go. Now, I've got a, a question for you. Do you want your life to go in the way of life or the way of death? Do you want it to go in the way of blessing or the way of cursing? How I many you know the Bible says that God lays before us life and death? Blessing and cursing. He says, choose life. Deuteronomy 30, 19. He says, choose life that you and your seed may live. That doesn't mean just exist. That means enjoy the life of God. Amen? See, you can choose poverty or you can choose prosperity. But you've got to determine which way you want your life to go. Do you want your life to go in the way of poverty or in the way of prosperity? The way you want it to go is to where you've got to point your tongue. The problem with most people is this. They say they want one thing, but they point their tongue in the opposite direction. Amen? Did any of you ever plow a mule? Let me give you a good example. Anybody ever plow a mule? When you plow a mule, and we had a mule when I was a boy, He'd plow this, plow this mule. You've got to learn to say G and haul. Somebody tell me what G means. Huh? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Some of y'all want G is what? And haul is what? Exactly. G and haul. Now, here's the problem. If I wanted that mule to go left, I need to be hollering G, okay? But guess what? Sometimes I get confused and I'd holler the wrong thing. And I'd want him to go this way, and he'd go that way. And that's exactly what all people are doing. They say, I want to be blessed. I want to live in divine health. I want God to prosper me and to bless me according to his word. It is a promise in God's word that if we obey him and live according to the principles of his word, that he will prosper the work of our hands. How many of you know that's in the word of God, right? There's a lot of people who say, I want to prosper, but they're pointing their tongue in a different direction. And their actions are not lining up with what it will take for them to find prosperity. Stay with me now, okay? Say it out loud. Say, I determine, I determine 
the way I want my life to go, and I point my tongue in that direction. Go with me, please, to Proverbs 18. Now, you might want to mark this because we're going to come back. In Proverbs 18, there's a very powerful Scripture, and, of course, there's many like it throughout the, throughout the Bible. A lot of people have never seen these Scriptures because nobody's ever pointed it out to them, nobody's ever taught on it, and they just didn't know it was there. You see, Solomon, in all of his wisdom, had much to say about the power of, of our tongue. In chapter 18, in verses 20 and 21, the Bible says, <clears throat> excuse me one moment, let me get over there with you. The Bible says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, now I want you all to notice that. Death and life are in the power of my tongue. Now, I'm talking about death and life to me. Death and life to you is in the power of your tongue. You can experience life, not only physical life, health, but the life of God through the words of your mouth, or you can actually experience physical death and even spiritual death through the power of your tongue. Now, I want you to listen carefully because some of you I know doesn't have an Amplified Translation. And if we, have, if we can, we'll get up on the board for you to see it. But the Amplified Translation of verse 20, the last part of verse 20, it says this. With the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied whether good or evil. With the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied. Now, in other words, what he's saying is you can either enjoy the benefits of speaking right, speaking words of life and blessing and healing, or you can suffer the consequences of saying the wrong thing. You can suffer the consequences of speaking death and sickness and poverty and depression. Folks, listen to me. I got saved when I was 18 years old, got into the Word of God, Got filled with the Holy Spirit. God called me to the ministry. Started listening to my spiritual father, Kenneth Hagin. And at that time, I had been very fortunate and been, you know, very blessed uh, to be, you know, very healthy most of my life. And up to that time, I'd never had a headache. Now, I grew up around people that were sick a lot. And, uh, and if I had followed the course, just like a lot of my family has, uh, I would have been sick a lot, lot as well. But I got a hold of word got a hold to the Word of God, the Word of faith. I learned the power of my words, and I began to say as a young man, I've never had a headache, and I never will. Now, I turned 55 last October, and I have never had a headache in my life. And I'm telling you again, in Jesus' name, I never will have a headache. I refuse to have the flu. I refuse to have any of these things that going around, the people are passing around. Some people say, I'm taking this, and some people, I'm, say, I'm taking that. Well, I just didn't sign up for it. I refused to sign up for it. Just because the UPS shows, man shows my door, don't mean I have to sign for the package. Amen? Just because it got my name on it. If I don't recognize it and I didn't order it, I don't have to take it. The devil will show up, and he'll say, this has got your name on it, and it's just for you. And you can just say, no, I'm not taking that, Mr. Devil, in Jesus' name. Amen? I didn't sign up for it, and I'm not going to have it. And I'll tell you something else. If my head did start hurting, which it's not, I would not say I have a headache. I would not say my head is hurting. You say, well, what would you say? Stick with me tonight. You're going to learn something. I would say this is what the Word says. The Word says resist the devil and he shall flee. Right? He will flee from you. Listen to me now. The Word teaches us that sickness and disease is of the devil. Therefore, I don't have to have it. And I can simply say, it is written. Jesus himself took my infirmities and bare my sicknesses and my pains by his stripes. We were healed. That means I was healed. That means I am healed in Jesus' name. Amen? What am I doing? I'm putting my tongue in the direction of the things that I desire. Everybody with me so far? Let me tell you something, folks. That verse 21 right there, death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
The Taylor translation says this, Men have died for saying the wrong things. I could stand here and tell you if we had the time, which we don't, of several people personally that I know has contracted diseases and actually died because of their own tongue. They have, I, I, I watched as people dug their own grave with their tongue. My dad, for example, as I've told you many times, we didn't grow up in a Christian home. My dad didn't get saved till uh, about a year before he passed away. And he uh, died young. It wasn't God's will for him to die young. He says, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. But if you don't do things the way God says to do them, then uh, you, can, you can die young. You can die before your time, the Bible says. Solomon asked, why should you die before your time? You can be uh, wicked. You can be over foolish, he says, and you could die before your time. Now, my dad didn't live for God. Like I said, thank the Lord he got saved about a year before he died, and he went to heaven. But you know what? Uh, he, he missed out on a lot. He missed out on all his grandchildren and great-grandkids. My mom's still alive, you know, and, but dad missed out on a lot. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, I, I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you a story that will help some of you. When my dad... When I was a boy growing up, my dad had a terrible temper. I mean terrible temper. Now, I'm not talking about one of those, you know, just get mad for a little bit and say a little bit. No. I mean, he'd just rant and rave, and he'd fuss, and he'd cuss, and he'd carry on and on and on. And then, of course, when he'd get through, you know, and he'd finally calm down, my mama would tell him, and I remember her saying it many times, my mom would tell him, I hope you get where you can't speak. I hope you get where you can't even say a word because she hated the profanity. You know, she'd got saved when she was a girl, just a young girl, and as an only child, uh, she married my dad against her parents' will. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. So she married out of the will of God as a Christian. She married an unbeliever, and uh, and she paid the price for it too. But she wouldn't, you know, she stu- she, she just made her mind, if I'm going to stay with him no matter what. And uh, But she tell him, I hope you get where you can't even talk. And after some time, you know, uh, he started picking up on that same thought. He started picking up on that same line. Because sometimes, you know, he'd get feeling bad about the way he acted and what he said and, and done. And he said, oh, I know, I know, I know. One day I'll get where I can't even talk. Well, my dad was only about 48 years old, somewhere around, around in there. He started stuttering. And he started tripping a little bit. You know, he'd be walking along just trip for no reason at all. And the stuttering got worse. And so finally he went to a doctor, and the doctor sent him to a specialist. And they diagnosed my dad have, as having amyotrophic lateral cirrhosis, AMS, better known as Lou Gehrig disease, the famous baseball player who died with Lou Gehr- uh, amyotrophic la- la- AMS. And uh, so they started calling it Lou Gehrig disease after him. At that time, there wasn't very few cases in the world. As a matter of fact, when my dad had it, it was, there was... A, very many cases known, but just a few hundred around the entire world. And so uh, the doctors told him, now listen carefully now, the doctors told him that the very first part of the body that is attacked is the muscle that controls your tongue. That was the first thing to go. He got where he couldn't talk, and then he got where he couldn't walk, and finally got where he couldn't use his hands, and he was actually just confined, just sitting, couldn't, couldn't do anything. So later, eventually, at the age of 51, he died from that disease. So you understand, I, I, I know how this thing works. I've watched others. I've watched, I've heard people actually say, I wish I could lose weight if I even had to get sick. I know of a young woman that said it. Two weeks later, she was diagnosed with diabetes, had lost 14 pounds, and was put into the hospital. I'm telling you, there's death and life in the power of your tongue. Some of you need to start thinking about what you're saying. Amen? Why do you think that David asked the Lord to set a watch upon the door of his lips? A door is something that you enter by and you exit by. A door is something that things can enter into your life or they can leave your life. Have you ever thought about your own mouth, your own lips as a door that allows things in? Or through that same channel, you can get rid of things out of your life. Amen? Now, go back to James. 
Here's the second example he gives us. In James 3, we talked about the horse. Look at verse 4. The next example, comparing things to the tongue, he talks about a ship. Behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about. There it is again, turned about with a very small helm, with a soever the governor listeth. Now, the point that James is trying to make is that something very small can turn about something that's very great. And if you read the rest of this, several more verses, he talks about what a small member your tongue is. But man, how powerful it is. Think about it. It's like a little spark in a forest that burns the whole forest down. Something so small can turn around or turn about something that is so very great. Now, i got a question for you. Number one, who determines the direction of the ship? The captain does, right? The Century English Bible says pilots direct their ships wherever they want. The Century English Version says a very small rudder controls that big ship, making it go wherever the pilot wants. Now, y'all listen to me carefully. I know you see bumper stickers, but how many know bumper stickers do not always truly represent the truth of God's Word? Huh? You know, you'll see bumper stickers that says, God is my pilot. You'll see some that say, God is my co-pilot. Well, which one is true? How many of you would like it if the Lord would Himself personally would take responsibility for the direction of your life? I would love it. Because we'd never miss it. If He would take personal responsibility for my life, then I would never miss it. Not in anything, in any way. Right? But folks, God made us with a, a will. He made us free moral agents. We get to choose. That's what he said. Remember Deuteronomy 30, 19 we talked about earlier? Choose life or choose death. Choose blessing or choose cursing, right? And in this situation right here, the pilot is the one, or the captain is the one who makes the decision as to what direction the ship is going. God allows you to choose what direction your life is going in. Now, He does give us His Word. He tells us, hey, this is what's best for you. If you'll listen to me, hearken to my Word, obey me. He said, if you'll be willing to obey, that you'll eat the good of the land. He said, the Bible says, if you obey and serve Him, that your days will be, uh, years will be with uh, plenty. I, I mean, He just promises so many things if we'll just do what He says to do. But yet, He leaves it up to us. He leaves it up to us. Are, are we going to obey Him? Are we going to believe Him? Are we going to trust Him? Are we going to operate according to His principles? Or are we going to do our own thing? Now, second question. See how smart you guys are. Which takes longer to turn about, a horse or a ship? How many say a horse takes... Uh, now, which one takes the longest to turn it around, the horse or the ship? How many say the horse? Raise your hand. How many say the boat, the ship? Raise your hand. All right, now, think about it. If you're on a horse, okay, unless you're the crazy horse like, you know, Jake that we had, but normal horses, okay, and once you pull that rein, it'll take but just a couple seconds and you turn that horse around. I mean, you're not going to turn that ship around like that. It's going to take a lot longer to turn that big ship around. Imagine uh, one of those cruise ships with a thousand people on it. Oh, yeah, it's got a very, the helm's there, and it will turn it. It's not a matter if it will turn it or not. But what I'm talking to you right now is how long does it take to turn it around? Think about this now. Some of you remember in school you studied something called the law of motion. Anything that's set in motion remains in motion unless it meets an equal and opposite force, Right? There are things that have been set in motion in people's lives. Some of those things have been headed in the, that same direction for years and years and years. 
As a matter of fact, before you're going to turn the situation around, any negative situation, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your physical body, or whatever it might be, before you're going to be able to turn that thing around, you're going to have to learn, hey, I've got to be just as consistent in speaking the Word as I was in what I used to say. You say, what are you talking about what you used to say? Things like... uh, my brother's famous, my brother-in-law's famous quote. If they were, I'm so poor, if, my, if they were selling ships for a penny a piece, all I could do is walk up and down the shore and say, ain't they cheap, boys? <laughs> now, if you've just been saying things like that, thinking it's funny, for the last 30, 40 years, guess what? You're not going to turn things around on a dime. Amen? I'm telling you. Well, we just pour snakes around here. See, I don't let things like that come out of my mouth concerning my life, our finances, our blessings. We don't do that. We say, this is what the Word says. Amen? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, He became poor for our sake, that we might be made rich. Amen? He took our sin, He took our sickness, He took our poverty, He took all of that so that we could have what? Salvation, healing, blessing, deliverance, prosperity. It's the great exchange, folks. Amos says, listen to me, in Amos 3.3, the Bible says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? If you want to walk with the Lord and have God's best for your life, then you must get in agreement with Him. Okay? It takes a lot longer to turn that ship around than it does a horse. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Because did you notice that that ship, he said, is driven by fierce winds? The word fierce in the Greek means violent winds, hurricane-type winds. So we're not talking about a ship on just a normal calm sea. We're talking about a great big ship that's in a hurricane can you imagine how long and how hard it would be turning around? It does not say that you can't turn it around. It does say you can't turn it around. But what I want you to understand is you've got to take the Word and you've got to start working on it. You've got to make a decision. I'm going to start working on this area of my life. I'm going to start working on my marriage. I'm going to start wake, working on how I bring up my children. I'm going to start working on my financial situation. I'm going to start working on my, my, my physical health. I'm going to take the Word and I'm going to start working on it. Now, what that means is you're going to have to learn to discipline your tongue. The Bible says that the healing of the tongue is a tree of life. What a lot of people need to first, they need to get their tongue healed before they consider getting the body healed. You understand what I mean by that? That means you're going to have to say, Lord, I need help with this tongue. Because James does say that no man can tame the tongue. He says it's a deadly evil. He says it's set on fire of hell. He said it determines the very course of nature. The literal Greek says the wheel of life. The wheel of life. Your tongue controls and determines the wheel of life, the course of nature, the very course for your life. That's the reason we keep saying it. Hey, listen, if you want what you've always had, just keep doing what you've always done. If you want something you've never had before, do something you've never done before. That means you may have to take a notebook. You may have to get you one of those little hand recorders and start just recording yourself and then sit down and listen to yourself. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? If you recorded every word that came out of your mouth for a full day and then sat down and played it back to yourself, you may be amazed at some of the stuff that came out of your mouth. Come on now. Y'all with me? Write it down. The winds of adversity were never meant to determine your destiny. The winds of adversity were never meant to determine your destiny. Even though those great ships were driven by such fierce winds, he says they can still be turned around by a very small helm. Whichever way the captain wants it to go, you can turn your life around. You could turn any negative situation in your life around. It is not up to God. It is up to you. 
the laws of God are already in force. The laws of God are already at work. You tap into the laws of God when you simply say, Lord, this is what your word says. I agree with your word, and I am going to do what you tell me to do concerning this, okay? Now, let me tell you something else some of you need to understand. When I said the winds of adversity were never meant to determine your destiny, you need to understand this right now. Because some of you may be going through some real challenging times in your life. You may be going through some real tests and trials. And you need to understand something. Sometimes God gives us grace to live opposite of our circumstances. Sometimes God gives us grace to live opposite of our circumstances. Go with me real quickly. I'm going to run through this real fast, but I want you to go to Genesis chapter 37. Joseph is a perfect example of what I mean by this, that God gives us grace to live opposite of the circumstances. For example, you know, if you've know, if been to, even in Sunday school growing up, you've probably heard the story about Joseph who dreamed a dream. It says in Genesis 37 verse 2 that he was 17 years old. Everybody see that? And it goes on to tell us how he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw his family bowing down to him. Now, the brothers already were mad at him. And the Bible says they hated him because he was their father's favorite son. The father even made this really nice, long, expensive, embroidered coat to give to Joseph. And they even hated him more, the Bible says, for that. And now when he comes to tell them this dream, they even hated him more. Can y'all get the picture here? Now, here's this young man, 17 years old. He's had two dreams, and he sees his family coming and bow down to him. Well, his family, his brothers, they decided they're going to get rid of this boy. And the Bible tells us they sold him. They faked his death. They sold him into slavery. He was bought in Egypt by a man named Potiphar. If you look at chapter 39, now remember he was 17 years old, right, when this all started. If you go to 39, chapter 39, verse 2 says the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3 says his master saw that the Lord was with him. The Lord made all he did to prosper. Verse 4 said Joseph found grace in his sight. Y'all see this? Now he's had a dream that these, this family is going to come and bow down to him, but he's, everything that's happening in his life so far is opposite of the dream. But now God has given him grace to live opposite of the circumstances he's put in. In other words, he's not given in to the circumstances by feeling sorry for himself. He's not mad at God. He's not mad at his brothers for what they did. He's just got his trust in the Lord. He's trusting God to bring him through. Now what happened? I want you all to see this. Potiphar's wife accused him of rape. He would not have sex with her. She accused him of rape. Potiphar threw him in prison. In prison, notice what happens. It says in uh, verse 20, it said they put him in prison. Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the warden. You know what happened then? The warden put him in charge of everything. Potiphar, who bought him as a slave, put him in charge of everything he had. But later he throws him in prison because he's, you know, accused of that. Now he finds favor with the warden in the prison. The warden puts him in charge over everything that goes on in the prison. And then, of course, you know, Pharaoh there in Egypt, he has a troubling dream. Nobody can interpret the dream. He hears about Daniel. Because during the years that Daniel was in that prison... Pharaoh had put his butler and his baker in prison. And they both had a dream. Daniel interpreted the dream. He told one of them, said, he's going to cut your head off. He said, the other one, he said, he's going to release you and promote you back to your position. Well, it happened just like Daniel said. Now Pharaoh begins to have dreams concerning famine in the land, but he doesn't really understand it, and he's looking for somebody. No one can interpret the dream. He hears finally 
the guy that interpreted, you know, Daniel interpreted his dream and told him you'd be promoted back into the palace. Now he remembers Daniel. He said, oh, I know a man. You know, several years ago when I was in prison, he interpreted my dream and it happened just like he said. He sends for him. He interprets the dream. And watch what happened. I want you all to see this. Because, folks, this, this is powerful. In chapter uh, 39, verse 46. Let me see if, if I'm in the right place. That's not where I wanted to go. Hold on a minute. I want y'all to see it. Chapter 41. Go to chapter 41. Chapter 41, verse 41. Now, I've skipped through a lot of things. You can go back and read this for yourself, but I want you to see what happened. In chapter 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. He was the vice president of the most powerful nation, richest nation on the face of the earth. If you look at verse 46, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. He had been in Egypt for 13 years. For 13 years, God gave him grace to live opposite of his circumstances. God will give you the grace to stand in faith regardless of of the situation regardless of the circumstances you don't have to live in fear you don't have to live in doubt and unbelief you don't have to have a pity party you can stand and have done all to stand until God's word is manifested in your life now go with me to Psalms 105 because I want you to see how Joseph turned the situation around in Psalms 105 it talks about how that God sent a man before Israel into Egypt of course, later on, you know, his family did come. They did bow down to him. The nation of Israel was birthed out of his family to become a great, great, great nation of millions of people. And here in Psalm 105, let's look in verse 18 and 19. It says, well, verse 17, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Now, folks, this is very important right here. Everybody say he was laid in iron. The Amplified says his soul entered into the iron. Now, why would the Amplified translate it that way? His soul entered into the iron. I went back and searched this out in the original Hebrew. And the word he in the King James is a reference to the soul of man, the activity of his mind, of his will, and his emotions. Now, I want you to imagine. Here's what a lot of people do. They allow their emotions to control them in a negative way. Joseph refused to do that. Joseph refused to give place to fear, to worry, and all these other emotions. But rather, the Bible says his soul entered his mind, his thought life, entered into the irons themselves. He said, how is that possible? Think about it, folks. Any situation you're going on right, it's going on in your life right now. If you have a negative situation going on in your life, either one or two things are happening. Either that thing has entered into your mind and taken control of your emotions, or your mind, by standing in faith with the Word of God, has entered into that situation to break the chains of it, to break the bondage of it off of your life. That's what Joseph did. And the very next verse, look at it. The very next verse says, Until the time that his word came. The word that God had given to him when he was 17 years old through the dream, that word came true. That word came to pass. It happened just like he said. Now go back to James, because I want you to go to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, we're going to see the word bridle again. Everybody say bridal. In verse 26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue. Now remember, that word bridal, you gotta, it means to lead, also to hold in check and to restrain. He says, If he does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and the man religion is in vain. Vain means useless, empty, futile. In other words, if you and I, if we do not restrain our tongues, what we say we believe 
is of no use. You can say you believe in divine healing, but if you don't restrain your tongue, it will be of no use to you. You can say you believe in salvation through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. But if you don't restrain your tongue from saying, well, I don't know. You know, I know he died for me, but, but I'm just not ready now. And, I, you know, I've got to stop doing this, and I've got to start doing that. No, here's what you've got to do. You've got to, with your heart, believe, and you've got to, with your mouth, confess unto salvation. You've got to say, I do believe that Christ died for me, that he rose from the dead. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Amen? I'm talking about really mean it from your heart. That's how you're born again. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen? Listen to this, folks. Proverbs 16, 23. Proverbs 16, 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth. Everybody say, I am wise. Say, I'm a wise person. In my heart teaches my mouth how to speak. Have you ever thought about that? Now, remember, a fool utters all his words. But a wise man holds it in until afterwards. Again, Proverbs fifteen twenty eight says, The heart of the righteous studies to answer. The heart of the righteous studies to answer. No wonder James said, Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, most people talk too much. And where there's a multitude of words, there is no lack of sin. That's what the Bible says. Where there's a multitude of words, there's no lack of sin. You mean I can sin with my mouth? Oh, yeah. You can hurt. You can criticize. You can gossip. You can curse. You can cuss. You can curse. Cussing and cursing is not the same thing. You know, when you get in that old car and you this piece of junk, you just cursed it, whether you know it or not. Now, when you use four-letter words, you might have cussed it too. And we ought not to be doing either one. I said we ought not to be doing either one. We ought to be speaking blessing. The Bible says we're called to inherit a blessing. To bless and do not curse. To bless means, the, listen to me, the word bless means to speak well of, to speak well to. It, it is indicating of prospering. So when God speaks blessing on you, when God says, if you bring the tithe and I'll bless you, He's talking about speaking blessing upon your life. Amen? Oh, folks, we've got to be careful what we say. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, stay with me here. This is very important. Because I'm talking to you about how to turn a negative situation around. I'm going to read this verse, and then I'm going to give you a good example right out of the Bible. You can go and... Go back and look it up yourself for those of you that are serious students of the Word and, and want to know how the Word of God works. Okay? In Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast. Everybody say, hold fast. The profession of our hope without wavering. Now, everybody say profession. Now, let's do be careful. Take notes if you can because I don't have time to turn to all these things. How many of you remember... Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, He said that whosoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father. The word confess is homologio. It comes from two words. Homo. What does homo mean? Same. Homosexual. Same. Logo means to speak or word. You put them together, that means to speak the same. So what Jesus was literally saying was, Whosoever speaks or says the same that I do before men, I will speak the same before my Father. you got to agree with him. Now that's homologio. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O means to speak the same. The word profession that we just read, hold fast to your profession of faith, some translations say confession. The word there in the Greek is H-O-M-O-L-O-G-I-A. It's just a little difference, but it's the same root word, and it literally means what you say. Hold fast to what you say. Hold fast to the confession of faith in God 
and faith in God's Word. Hold fast to it. That means don't waver from it. Remember what James said in chapter 1 about the man who wavers? He's like the waves of the sea tossed to and fro. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And the to me, folks, when you pray and you say, Lord, now I'm going to stand on your word. And you say, I'm going to pray the prayer of faith to receive my healing. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith to receive one of the redemptive blessings, the things you've already provided, that it's, an, it's my inheritance. I know it's mine according to your word. I know it's your will for me to have it. So you pray, and you pray in faith, believing the moment you pray that you receive. Now, all, you don't always see an immediate change. You don't always see immediate results in the natural. You always have to affect the realm of the Spirit before the realm of the natural world is affected. So when we pray in faith, God hears us. And the Bible says, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have. The thing is, you've got to remember is this, you've got to believe you got it before you get it. You've got to believe you've got it by faith before you get it in the natural. Okay? That's when you've got to now hold fast to your confession of faith. Now look at the rest of that verse. You hold fast to the profession of your hope or faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise, without wavering. In other words, you don't say, I'm healed today and tomorrow I'm sick. Today I'm blessed, tomorrow I'm cursed. Huh? See what I'm saying? You've got you to gotta make your mind up, and I'm going to put a watch upon these lips, and I'm going to speak nothing but the word only. Now, remember a man named Abram who had a wife named Sarai. Now, we know him as Abraham and Sarah because once God said, I'm changing both of your names in Genesis 17. He said, Abram, I'm changing your name to Abraham, which means father of faith. Now, they were old folks at the time. Now, watch this, folks. He said, I'm changing Sarah's name to Sarah, which means mother of princes. So when they told people their names, people heard them say, I'm the father of nations. Can you imagine a man who's, who's a... 90-something years old, walking around and saying, I'm the father of the nation. He doesn't even have one son. People think he's crazy. People are going to think you're crazy. If you start confessing what the Word says about you, and it hasn't showed up in your life yet, people will think you've lost your mind. Well, you've got a choice. You can be more concerned about what they think or more concerned about what you are wanting to receive from God and what God says. Amen? So they begin, Romans 4, 17. Listen carefully to me now. Says that he began to call the things that be not as though they were. When you are operating and standing in faith, you have prayed and you believe you received, you've got to start calling the things that be not in the natural as though they were already in the natural until they are in the natural. Y'all get that? Just because it does not exist in the natural where you can see it, feel it, touch it, does not mean that it does not exist. You cannot see angels, but guess what? They're here. Amen? Abraham is a perfect example of somebody who turned a negative situation around. Y'all, listen to me carefully. Several years ago, Many years ago, I had been preaching for several years already. I was still a young man. I started having problems with my back. I went to a doctor after, you know, you know, I don't even remember how long. It got to the point where it was almost unbearable, the pain. And my lower back running down my leg. I went to a doctor, and he said it's uh, uh, sciatica. At the time, I'd never even heard of sciatica. He explained it to me about the nerves and all this. And uh, I'd sleep at night with my knees pulled up in a fetal position. I couldn't stand more than about five minutes at a time or I'd have to bend my knee like this, put it up on a bumper of a car or a chair or something. It would relieve the pressure. And so the doctors tried various things and none of it worked. And finally, he said, we need to do surgery. And I refused the surgery because I'd heard of people who had the surgery and they said they wish they'd never done it. And at the time, I was preaching healing anyway. People were getting healed. And I said, well, this is an opportunity for me to stand on the Word of God. And uh, I'm going to stand for myself. And I, at the time, I didn't know anybody other than, you know, other than Kenneth Hagin that really uh, preached healing. And so I found out he was going to be holding a meeting over in Birmingham, Alabama. 
And I went there, and uh, the night that he uh, laid hands on me, he had preached the word. Many people had gotten saved, and they gave an altar call to pray for the sick. Now, we're in a, the big auditorium downtown, Civic Center in Birmingham, Alabama. Thousands of people. He said, you know, now, I don't have time to stop and talk to each one. We'll be here all night long. He said, I'm not the healer. He said, I'm just going to lay my hands on you. When I walk by, I'll just touch you and say, you know, be healed, or in the name of Jesus, be healed, or something like that. He said, then I'm going to keep moving. Because they literally, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, I mean, lined up across that auditorium, down the walls, across the back of the auditorium. I ain't going to tell you how many. It must have been five, six, seven hundred people in the, that wanted to pray for healing. And so uh, I got in that line. He walked by me. Now, I'm watching out of the corner of my eye because he's laying hands on people. And boy, people are just falling under the power of God. I mean, just about everybody he touches, falling under the power of God. And I'm standing, he walks by, he touches me, be healed in Jesus' name. I didn't feel a thing. Folks, you ain't got to feel something. Just because you don't feel nothing, it's no indicator that you didn't receive. I received. As soon as he laid his hands on me, I said, Lord, that's it. I said, your word says they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I went down and went back to my seat, and I wrote down the date. I wrote down the time, and I said, I believe on this date, this time, that I received my healing through the laying on of hands. I believe that a healing and a cure is working in my body, and by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. That means I am healed. Now, what am I doing? I'm turning a situation around. When I got up the next morning, I had more pain, I believe, than I'd ever had before. Now, here's what most people would have done. They would have canceled out everything that happened the night before by saying. Everybody say saying. saying. Remember, death and life, power of the tongue. Jesus said you've got to speak to the mountain. He didn't say talk about the mountain. He didn't say talk to somebody else about the mountain. Amen. He said speak to it. Speak to the mountain. And he said, if you'll speak to that mountain, he said, say this, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have, say it with me, whatsoever he saith. Lego, the Greek word, Lego. Building blocks, just like toys that kids use. That's the Greek word, Lego. Your words is the building blocks for your life. Your words are the building blocks for your children's lives. Your words are the building blocks concerning your physical health and healing, concerning your mental well-being, your financial well-being. Your words are your building blocks. You have today what you said yesterday, last week, last month, the last year, and so on and so forth. You're going to have tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, what you say today and tomorrow and so on. I'm telling you what, if the people of God got a revelation of this and got excited about it and really believed it and acted on it, I mean, you couldn't keep people out of church. They'd be like, you mean tell me I can have what I say? I didn't say that. I didn't write that. Listen to me, I'm not one who wrote it. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that said it. Say it out loud. Say, if I believe in my heart, and I do not doubt in my heart, but believe that those things which I say shall come to pass, I shall have whatsoever I say. Now, there's the key. Do you believe your own words? Do you believe your own words? God created you in His image with the ability to speak. Amen? Amen. Folks, I'm telling you, it's powerful. It's powerful. All you've got to do now is hold fast. Now, folks, to turn that ship around, that captain can't hold it. You know, he pull, he, he turns that helm, and he says, he holds it there for about five minutes. He says, I'm tired. And he turns loose, and it straightens back up. And then he waits about five minutes. You know, you know, I think I will turn this thing around. I don't like the direction it's going in. So this time he turns it the other way. And he holds it for about 10, 15 minutes. And he says, you know what? I just don't believe this is working. I just don't see nothing happening. I just don't think this is working. So he just turns. You know, that's exactly what people do a lot of times. They say, this is not working. I'll never forget one guy coming to Brother Hagin one time. He said, Brother Hagin, he said, you know that stuff you teach about faith and confession, confessing the Word? He said, yeah. He said, it's not working. Brother Hagin looked at it and said, sounds like to me. It's working pretty good. 
And the man said, huh? You just said it's not working. Sounds to me like it's working pretty good for you. Because if you say it's not working, guess what? It's not working. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this thing out, folks. Are you with me now? It's not going to do... Listen to me, folks. I'm going to tell you something else. I wasn't going to do this, but I got five minutes. I'm going to tell you this, okay? I went for years and years and years with no pain in my body after I received that healing because I didn't tell you the rest of it. I confessed that word that I told you about for two solid weeks, literally dozens and dozens of times a day. My wife stood with me. We stood on the word. And for about two or three weeks, all of a sudden, one day right in the middle of Disney World on vacation with Jeremy in my arms, four months old, I realized there's no pain in my body. It was manifested. Now, I received when hands were laid on me. As far as God was concerned, it was done when Jesus took my sickness and put his own body. I believe I received it when hands were laid on me according to his word. I held fast to my confession. I turned that situation around. We went years and years and years. About five years ago, I was bird hunting with my brother down in Georgia, sitting on one of those cans that spin, and a bird came through, and about the time I spun and shot, something about the recoil of the gun, my, I felt a catch in my back. And by the time I got back to the house, I was in a lot of pain. And by the time we got back home to South Carolina, you're talking about, oh, man, my, my family will tell you they'd never seen me like that before. I went for weeks and weeks and weeks in such pain, I thought, Lord, it would be better off just go ahead and go to heaven. I didn't say it. I thought it, but I didn't say it. And because uh, I was hurting. I mean, I was in so severe severe pain. I'm talking about on the scale from 1 to 10, it was 150. I had never, huh? Oh, get out of here. She said for a woman or a man. And, uh, but let me tell you something. Now, I did. I went to a chiropractor and uh, they tried different things and got some relief and it got so bad, some of you that were here remember one Sunday morning, I actually had a table up here, and I sat in a chair and preached. Y'all remember that? Because I told the devil, I've never missed a service because of sickness or disease or pain, and I never will, and I'm not going to miss one now either. Amen? And folks, the whole time, here's my confession. I'm standing on the Word. Well, finally, I just got with God, and I said, Lord, I'm not going to the doctor anymore. I'm not going anymore any, any chiropractor treatments. I'm not doing any of it. You're my physician. You are my healer, and I'm going to stand on your Word. And I made a, I had a daily discipline. From the time I got up in the morning, the first thing I did is I had a confession of faith that I went through. I spoke to my body. I stood on God's Word. He gave me particular scriptures. I, he gave me one out of Colossians 1, 17. By Him all things consist. And He said, look it up. I looked up the word consist. That means held together. And I began to say, Lord, you're holding my body together. They told me the disc would all deteriorate and all this kind of stuff. You know, you've got to have all this surgery and stuff. And I just started standing on the Word. And little by little, I turned that situation around. Little by little. You say, you turned it around? I turned it around. It was God, and I give Him the glory and the praise. It was His power at work. But He didn't just show up and turn it around all by Himself. He didn't turn Abraham and Sarah's life around by Himself. He had to have their cooperation. I started calling the things that be not as though they were. Amen? Are y'all with me so far? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you, Father, God, that your word is truth. And tonight, Lord, I pray that every person here will be sanctified, set apart by your truth. Oh, we love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. What a mighty God you are. We thank you tonight, Father God, that you are faithful. And we purpose in our heart to hold fast to our confession of faith without wavering, for you are faithful who has promised. We bless you. We praise you. We magnify you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, tonight if you're here and you say, Pastor, I've never been born again. I want to give Jesus my life. I want to surrender to him. I want to be born again. I want to accept his love and his forgiveness, the sacrifice he made. I, I want his blood to wash away my sins, remove the guilt and the shame of it all. I want to receive eternal life, the very life and nature of God into my heart right now. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand. Anybody, you say, tonight, I want to give my life to Jesus. If you're here and you say, I have been saved, but I haven't lived for God. I haven't been walking the way I should have walked. I need to re rededicate my life to Him. I want you to lift your hand real quickly. 
I see this hand over here. Anybody else? You say, tonight, I rededicate my life to the Lord. Now, saints, listen to me very carefully. I want you to pray with me out loud. And if anybody else, you wish you'd raise your hand and you didn't, just mean it from your heart. God sees you. God hears you cry. He cry. He hears the heart of those that are repentant and those that are coming to Him in faith. So right now, as a whole church, I want you to pray. And those of you that raise your hand, wish you'd raise your hand, you pray and mean it from your heart. Say it out loud. Lord God. I do believe that Jesus loved me and died for my sins. I believe with all my heart that He rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. He's alive today. And with my mouth, I confess, Jesus, You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And I receive You. And I ask You to forgive me, Lord. I rededicate my life to You, Lord. I surrender everything unto You. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit working in my life to clean me up, to make me holy, to help me to live godly in an ungodly world. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. Now, listen to me carefully. If you're here and you say, I need healing, I want you to lay your hands on me. I'm going to believe tonight that I release my faith through the laying on of hands. I believe that it's a point of contact that when you lay your hands on me, the healing anointing will come into my body and I'm going to receive by faith and I'm going to hold fast to my confession of faith until I see it manifested in my life. If that's you, I want you to come on down right now. Anybody at all, you say, I want healing and I'm going to receive it tonight. I'm not going to wait based on a feeling. I'm not going to wait based on anything else other than what God's Word says. My faith is in God's Word. He took my infirmity. He bare my sicknesses. By His stripes, I was healed. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Honey, would you come help me? Y'all stretch your hands out this way, saints. Everybody in agreement now. Just stretch your hands out. And let's all say it together. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father we, believe we believe that through the laying on of hands, the, on of hands, the healing anointing, healing anointing is, imparted is imparted and will be imparted, will be imparted. this very night. This we believe, we, believe. We, will we will receive in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the healing anointing. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. Praise you, Lord, for that healing anointing flowing into her body. Praise you, Father God, that faith activates the anointing. <laughs> oh, it's flowing, 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 flowing. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke sickness. Yes. I rebuke the devil, and I break the power of it off of your life right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, thank you for the healing anointing. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be whole. There it is right there. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the healing anointing. Thank you, Lord, for the healing anointing flowing from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Thank you, Lord. Oh, what a mighty God you are. How good you are. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we love you and we bless you. We praise you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Well, saints, we're so glad you're here. You came tonight, and we invite you to be back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I ask you to uh, come, if you can, to pray with us at, uh, Saturday morning at 9 the Camden group is meeting at uh, 4 o'clock at uh, Chastity. Chastity, raise your hand. Chastity's house. Her and Kelly's uh, having prayer over there. And anybody else that wants to come, you can join with them. Amen? And if not, uh, don't see you before. We'll see you at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. God bless you. You are dismissed.